When we consider leadership in our nation, in our churches, in our lives, we often tend toward the, the dramatic or the charismatic individual to, to rise up and be a leader amongst men. Now we're looking for somebody who can, who can rally the troops and, and kind of get out there and, and, and bring in the dollars or whatever it might be. And I, I was told one time that leadership today looks more like the mascot on the field than the coach. That the mascot goes out there and, and rallies the crowd and everybody gets excited. The mascot's cheering them on. But the mascot's not playing the game. He's there to kind of bolster the crowd and get them excited. But he's not there throwing the pass or calling the next play. And when the real game is being played, the mascot's not even on the field. And others are taking over the responsibilities. But a lot of times leadership today is nothing more than finding the best mascot who can get out there and draw attention to a particular cause or a particular bent. It is not leadership that a lot of people seek. What they're looking for oftentimes is nothing more than excitement. Who can bring the best excitement? We, when I was in the military in basic training, we left Texas and went to Colorado. I was being transferred to my next assignment. And I got to my next assignment and it was tech school. For those of you who have been in the military, you know what I'm talking about. You go from basic training to your next assignment, which is your schooling, your education, your training for the career that you're going to have in the military. And so I went from Texas to Colorado and our squadron is needing to pick a squad leader. And our, our, our commander, our, our um, squad commander, the, the actual guy in charge, is going to pick a squad leader. And he comes out to the squad, we're all standing in formation, looking like a lot of good obedient statues, and, and he looks and he finds the biggest guy, tallest, widest, strongest looking fella. He says, you are the squad leader. And, and, and the look of fear that crossed his eyes was priceless. He didn't want to be the leader. All he had going for him was that he was bigger and stronger than the rest of us. But does that qualify as leadership? Well, it did because <laughs> what he was hoping is that everybody else would be scared of this guy and so they would all do what he says. Well, he couldn't, he couldn't have let himself out of a paper bag. He was a nice guy. It, too nice to be in leadership, to be honest with you. He was kind and gentle. And he's like, whatever you guys want to do, go ahead. You know, I don't know what to do. And, and the squad was starting to fall apart for lack of leadership. And it wasn't this guy's fault that he's the biggest and strongest of us. But that's who the commander picked. And so he's trying his hardest to get people encouraging them. I mean, he's really saying, well, why don't you stand here? Why don't you stand here? Why don't you stand here? And so the commander came out and he saw the squadron in just disarray. It was weeks after the squad was in just disarray. And he's like, what is going on? And here's the poor guy trying to, 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 to you know, get us all in order. And, and he didn't know what to say or do. And, and so the squad commander picked somebody else. He picked somebody else that kind of was forceful and um, wasn't the biggest guy. In fact, he was one of the smaller guys there. But who could, who could rally them, not to encourage them and try and make them like him, but who could command and call upon them, get in order and do it now. And so the new squad leader took charge, and the other guy, the, the fear that he had weeks before turned to dramatic relief that day. When he finally, all he had to do was follow orders. That's all he wanted to do. He couldn't be the commander. And that's okay. Leadership is a quality that God has gifted in people. 
But there are some defining <coughs> characteristics of good leaders. You see, we're in a state right now in our country where we need good leadership. Can anybody say amen to that? <laughs> we need men and women who are going to rise up and define or, or, or fill the role of what God defines as leadership, as a good leader among men. Saul, the first king of Israel, was picked because he was the biggest and the fastest and the strongest. But he wasn't a good leader. <coughs> king David was the next one that God picked. See, man picks Saul. God picks David. Do you know the difference between the two? David was a man after God's own heart. You see, we would not have picked the 12 apostles to be apostles. And the, and, the, and the instigating leaders of the church. We would never have picked them. They were, they were the rough and the rugged, the fishermen and the tax collectors. They were, there was a zealot among them, Simon the Zealot, and then there was a traitor. Who would have picked him? He didn't actually lead the church, though. There was the doubter, poor Thomas, always labeled with that um, wonderful moniker now. And there was the depressed, Oh, you, you remember, what's his name? Philip. Well, let's just go to Jerusalem and then we'll all die. Well, thank you, sunshine. <laughs> James and John, the sons of thunder, wanted to make sure that they got the positions on either side of Jesus. So who did they bring in? Mom, could you talk to Jesus for us? Yeah. Mom, really? <laughs> It was Peter who was ready to go to war for Jesus, but not ready to go to death for him. These are the men that Jesus picked to be the leaders of the church. We wouldn't have picked them. But God sees beyond what is on the surface of things and sees what is on the internal workings of a man's life. He has given us some definitions of leadership. And this month, we're going to be taking a look, Sunday after Sunday, of the qualities of leadership. Today, we're going to define leadership out of Hebrews chapter 13. If you have your Bible, turn there. If not, it'll be on the board here for you. Hebrews chapter 13, verses 7 and 8. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Let's pray. Father in heaven, show us, Father, how we must rise up to the defining qualities of leadership in our own lives, where we are all in leadership somewhere. Whether we're leading our homes as husbands and wives, as fathers and mothers. Whether we're leading our school as teachers or, or servants. Father, whether we're, we're leading our community, or, or maybe, Father, just leading our own lives. God Almighty, show us how we need to define ourselves in the leadership role you've given us. According to your word, not according to men. According to the parameters that you set, not according to what the world defines as leadership. We want to see it your way and no way else. God Almighty, I pray for the leaders of our country. I pray, Father, for those two men who are fighting themselves, Father, to become president of this United States. For the one who serves as president now and for the one who's rising up to become president. God Almighty, I pray that you would help them to see real leadership and what it is. Forgive them, Father, for the pride and arrogance of their hearts. And turn them, Father, to a humble recognition of what you desire in a man's life. Forgive our senators and congressmen, Father, who, who see themselves only as the aristocracy of our nation and not as its servants. And forgive us, Father, for electing men who do not uphold the word of God. Rally your people again to seek real leaders. In Jesus' name, amen.
the first thing we're going to take a look at here in defining leadership is that a real leader, a real leader has a message worth hearing. A real leader has a message worth hearing. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Now, I, I do want to, to give you an understanding. We are taking principles out of this text that we're going to apply across the board. The, 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 the context of this is that he's talking about those church leaders who are preaching to them. He's talking about the pastors and deacons and elders and, and evangelists that are out there preaching the word of God. Remember these men who are doing these things, who are preaching the word of God. And I want to bring us back in time for just a moment. In that period of time before the great revolution hit America and we rose up against our um, British Empire. There were preachers in the land then. And do you know what they were saying? They were crying out against the oppression and tyranny that was being fostered against the people in the colonies. Do you know who began the revolution for America's freedom? It wasn't the politician, it was the preacher. It was the man of God who stood behind the pulpit and declared with certainty that God has called us to be free. It was the preacher who began the cry for independence in America. It was not the politician. And it's going to be the preacher again who lays out the groundwork for what it's going to take for America to rise up again. Because the standards haven't changed. You see, it's not the politician who's out there proclaiming truth to you. And I don't know if you knew that or not. Um, and it's not going to be the, the, the political hacks on TV. It's going to be the preachers standing for the Word of God. They're going to give you what you need to know to make wise choices. We have an amazing gift in this country. It's the gift of choosing our leaders. Most nations around the world don't have that gift. <clears throat> In, down in Venezuela right now, they're, they're choosing a leader. They're voting. You've got to be kidding me. It's going to be what's-his-name Chavez. You know that. <coughs> we know that. He's going to find a way to make sure he stays in power because that's what he does. And if he gets voted out, maybe there is going to be a revolution there. And we can only pray that it will be for freedom. But here in America, we have the privileged opportunity of choosing our leaders. And last year, not last year, four years ago, 17 million Christians didn't vote. Are you surprised? What would happen if the voice of 17 million Christians rose up with one voice and saying, we want God's man, not the world's? I don't know. I think we may see our nation change. 117 million Christians declare their faith in Jesus Christ in this country for to understand. I haven't met them all. <coughs> if 117 million of those who claim Jesus Christ as their Savior rose up in a country of 300 million, do you think it would change the course of our nation? I think so. The question is, do we understand what real leadership looks like? Well, the first thing we see is that a leader has a message worth hearing. It is a message worth hearing. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. It is a message worth hearing. It is not a message necessarily that we like to hear. You see, there's going to be a lot of people gathering for themselves, people who will say anything that their itching ears want to hear, and we'll see this in a minute. But God's man, true leadership, has a message worth hearing. Anyone who takes on the role of leadership and does not know and speak the truth is not leading, they're manipulating. Anything other than the truth is unworthy of the task of leadership. I'll say that again. Anything other than the truth is unworthy of the task of leadership. Do not think that your political favorites out there are the person God has purposed to be a leader. Are they speaking the truth? I heard somebody say no. 
and you're right. Give me an honest atheist before a hypocritical Christian any day. You say, whoa, pastor, don't you want a Christian in office? Of course I do. But I don't want who's claiming to know Christ and yet living like the world. I don't want a deceiver. I don't want a manipulator in chief. I don't want somebody who's going to stand there and tell me what I want to hear and then go and do his own thing that's against the word of God. I don't want a president who's going to tell me that he, he believes in the sanctity of life, but it's okay for women to kill their children. I don't want a president who's going to tell me that he honors marriage and the commitment between a husband and wife, and then he goes behind my back and he signs a bill that says that homosexuality in marriage is okay. I don't want a leader who manipulates. Now, if I have a leader who tells me on one side that he doesn't believe the Bible, he doesn't believe the Word of God, he doesn't uphold to the scriptural truth, and he lives that out, okay, fine, at least he's honest. I'm not going to vote for him, but at least he's honest. It's the manipulator that we need to fear. It's the deceiver who comes in with the glowing words and the shining armor who says that I'm the one that can, can change everything. Listen to his words, yes, but watch his actions. Don't just listen to what he says. We'll get to that next point here in just a minute. But a real leader speaks the truth. That's what he speaks. It's not leadership if you're not speaking the truth. It's manipulation. That's all it is. It's deception. Well, when you don't have truth, what do you have? A lie. I mean, this is not hard, folks. This is not, you know, you know differential calculus here. If you don't have truth, you have a lie. If you don't have right, what do you have? Wrong. Oh, so I thought somebody was going to say left. But <laughs> you have wrong. If you don't have honesty, you have deception. If you don't have integrity, you have manipulation. What do you want as a leader? Who do you want as a leader? Take a man who speaks the truth first and foremost who has a message that's worth hearing. It says this in Timothy. In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, I give you this command, he says. I give you this charge. Preach the word. I want you to go there with me to 2 Timothy. Just a couple of books earlier. 2 Timothy, chapter 4. Second Timothy chapter 4, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of His appearing in His kingdom, I give you this charge. Preach the word. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. For the time will come when men will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myth. But you keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, discharge all the duties of your ministry. There is a time coming, and I believe that time has now come, when men do not want sound doctrine. They do not want the truth. They want to hear whatever they want to hear, and they want their politicians and leaders to say whatever they want them to say. And, and then we'll go ahead and agree with them. Not that which is true, and maybe hard, but that which is a lie, but maybe comforting. Are we really comforted with a lie? I mean, if, imagine for a moment, I come home to my wife. And I, my wife is like, uh, honey, we've got lots of debt. Yes, we do. But that's okay. I have solved the problem. We're going to be out of debt in four years. Oh, really? How? Well, you see all the debt that we have over here? I'm going to put it on this credit card right here. And now you don't see this debt over here, right? Because I got it on this credit card over here. And don't worry, we'll pay that off someday. But while we're trying to pay that off, we'll just raise this over here too, because now we got a bunch of empty credit cards, right? We could use those now. I just manipulated her. I just made her believe that I took care of the problem. I didn't take care of the problem. 
I just lied to my own wife. And by the way, we're not doing that here. So, <laughs> <laughs> but we are trying to get yeah. out of that. So, um, it's, it's manipulation. It's not truth. I, I want the truth. Even if it hurts, I want the truth. Even if it means that I have to, to sacrifice more to help my country, I want the truth. I don't want to hear how, how pleasant pie in the sky is going to be later on in the hereby and by. I want it what is going to be right now. Tell me now what is. And then we can go forward. Because I can't make decisions and choices based upon a lie. A leader who's worth his salt speaks the truth. Even when it's hard. If we're going to define leadership as a message worth hearing, true leaders also have a life that is worth considering. Consider the outcome of their way of life. Consider the outcome. I love that. Look at what comes out of their way of life. What is coming out of their life? They have a life that's worth considering. It, do you see out of the leader's life Good or bad? Righteousness or villainy? What do you see coming out of your leaders' lives? What is the outcome of it? What is the outgrowth of what they're doing, of their decision, of their belief system? What is the outcome? Don't, don't imagine that what they're saying is completely true. Listen to everything they say and then measure their words against their life. Because a man's life will speak volumes over a man's words. If there's no humility, if there's no repentance, if there's no forgiveness, if there's no discharge of the duties of life according to the word of God, then I have a hard time believing that the man is trying to follow Jesus. I really, I don't believe it. If there's pride and arrogance, self-determination, if there, is, if there is a constant attitude of superiority and an aristocracy about them, I believe that they're the God of their own life. And they're sitting on their own throne believing that they have all the answers and they're not turning to God at all. What is the outcome of our leaders' lives? Take a look at what they do. I think it was Aristotle who made that very clear in his writings. Never judge a man by his words alone. But judge a man according to his actions. Seems simple enough. Don't look at a man for what he says. For what he does. I think it was Peter, or James, might have been James, who said this, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Do what it says. Are the lives of our leaders living out the message that they proclaim? Now they might be. I mean, we, we've got today, we've got in our state, we've got two men running for, for governor. We've got, we've got Rob McKenna and Jay Inslee running for governor. Are their words matching their actions? Look at what they've done and what they do. And listen to what they say. And see if it matches up. Because it's not words alone that's going to bring your understanding of what the leader is, or who the leader is, I should say. He has a life that must be considered. Of what value is truth that goes unheeded in the leader's life? The mark of true leadership is not only knowing the truth and speaking the truth. It is striving to live out the truth and offer for others a life that is worth consideration. How many times do we see our leaders saying, you need to do as I do? Do we see that? Do as I do? No, 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 no. See, we have the Simon Says leadership sometimes. Do as I say, not as I do. You know, when, when, when we hear leaders say that we need to be generous, I'm all for that. And Patty can tell you, I'm probably more for that than I ought to be. I, I love generosity, and I love a leader who wants to live a generous life. And when they're telling us that we need to be generous and we need to be willing to sacrifice and give, yes, I agree with that. But I'm going to look at their life. And if I hear them telling, I need to give more of what I have to help those in need, I'm all for that. 
But are you doing it too? If I give away 30% of my income to help the poor, I'll be blessed in that. I'm happy to do that. But if my leader is telling me to do that and he's giving away less than 1% of his income, I've got questions. His life is not matching his words. We cannot say that he's real, a real leader if he's just telling us what to do and he's not living it out himself. Don't tell me that you think you need to raise taxes if you're finding a tax shelter. Don't tell me you think we need to feed the poor if you keep all of your wealth to yourself. Don't tell me that you think we need to reach out to our fellow man if all you ever do is go and cloister yourself away from everybody so you don't have to be touched by anybody's pain. Don't tell me you're a leader if your words are not matching what you say. Your life is not matching what you say. Real leadership has a life that's worth consideration. Paul says it quite clearly right here. Where is it at? There it is. Follow my example. As I follow the example of Christ. Is there anyone in your life that you can look to and say, that's the Christian I want to be. That's the life that I want to have. That's the faith I want to experience in my own life. See, I've got men like that in my life. I've got four pastors in my life that have been that for me. Who have been for me true leaders. Dr. Martin down in California, Gary Martin, my first pastor. And a godly man and a preacher extraordinary. Um, extraordinary preacher. I, I, I don't know why he's not, um, except that God has purpose for him to be where he's at. Why he's not voicing to the world the message of Christ. If you ever get a chance to go to wintonchurch.org, I think is what it is, is his church. Listen to the sermons. You may actually hear some, um, some of me in him, because I've taken a lot of who I am out of him. Um, godly man and a great preacher. I've, I've learned from him and I've garnered from him being a pastor. Danny Dixon is another and some of you know Danny. Um, a, a godly man and a good friend. And the guy who told me as we were on the golf course, by the way, I liked him the most, not because he golfed with me, but because he was, you know, just a fantastic, generous heart. And he told me on the golf course, Michael, he said, this was before I was a pastor. I was in his church. He said, Michael, there's going to come a day when you're going to discover that if in your church somebody has a feeling left to be hurt, the devil's going to find a way to hurt it. He told me that. Like He was right, by the way. And we all have feelings and nerves that get stepped on. And the devil makes sure he knows how to press those buttons. He says, Michael, don't take it personal. He taught me how to be patient with people because he was exceptionally so. Another fellow, Fred Seidler, who's now in Indiana, and he, I believe, retired now. I think Fred's retired. His health is not good. Fred Seidler, a a wonderful, godly pastor, who who emulates for me the passion of ministry, and I learned passion from him. You you couldn't have slowed this guy down with an anvil. I mean, he was just always, always, always on good. And another one, David Young who you've all met, he's actually been up here to preach. And David Young is a man of prayer. And I saw how how God moves through men of prayer. See, I've got men like that in my life. And there's others still. My daddy's dad, Elvin, um, is a man of grace. And I, and I see grace in him just oozing it again. There's so, there's so many in our lives that God has given us to be defined leaders in our lives who we can look to and say, that's a life that's worth my consideration. That's the life I want to see. But I want to see this in my leaders also in Washington and in Olympia and here in our town. I want to see leaders like that who live out what they say, who live the truth and live according to the the, the values and the structures of the Word of God. Follow my example, says Paul. In what way? As I follow the example of Christ. If you're a leader and you're a Christian and you are not following the example of Christ, I am not going to follow you. That's just the bottom line. Don't tell me you're a Christian leader, and if you're not following Jesus, there's something wrong with you. A leader has a message that's worth hearing. A leader has a life that is worth considering. A leader has a faith that is worth imitating. 
Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Imitate their faith. Have you ever been with a leader who just didn't have a clue where he was going? You ever been with somebody? If you're not your head, you've been in the military. You know exactly what I'm talking about. You're like, yeah, I've yeah, been there, done that. Um, I just had no clue. I mean, and absolutely a faithless leader, a person who has absolutely no, no understanding of, of making a choice. I, I was working at a company down in um, Fife. Um, it was called NEC Technology. We built laptops and repaired laptops. I, I worked in the repair department, and I, I ran the, the repair department. I, and, and, and I was young still, and I, I was inexperienced. I really hadn't a whole lot of leadership experience. And I was scared and nervous, and I'm like, well, people are like, well, what do we do, Michael? How much? What's our production quotas, and what do we have to do? I don't know. I just maybe make a computer. Go ahead and do it. And finally, this one guy, a little bit older than me, who had been around a little bit longer than me, he pulls me aside, and he grabs me by the arm. He says, I need to talk to you, and he grabs me away. I'm like, I and he said, no, 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 come with me. So he, he, he said, Michael, he said, you need to lead this team. You need to lead this team in a direction that you are confident in. He says, you've got to have faith that you are doing what you know to do and be confident in the doing of it. He said, this wishy-washy kind of I don't know what to do approach is not going to work, Michael. You're not going to get this team prepared and ready to do what we've got to do to get our quotas out. He said, Michael, you have been put in charge. And whether you like it or not, they're going to look to you to have guidance and determination. He says, Michael, and this was the greatest line I'd ever heard. He says, do something, even if it's wrong. Like, wow. At least you're doing something. Leaders make mistakes. But they've got to have faith. You've got to have an absolute certainty that where they're going is going to be the course that needs to be taken. A faith that is anchored upon truth, that is built upon a life that is emulating that truth, is a, is a faith that has to be determined, that has to be certain. It's a faith that cannot waver. Real leadership has at its core a determined and steady faith. Leaders must have a faith that is worth imitating. It does no one any good if a leader is constantly doubting the truth and pursuing popular opinion. What good is a leader who's always looking to find out what the wind is going to say next? Check the wind, see which way it's blowing, and that's the way I'll go today. That's not leadership. That's abdicating leadership. Leadership is willing to tack against the wind sometimes and run roughshod over the wind sometimes and say that this is the way of truth, this is the way that is right, this is the way that is necessary. A real leader has faith to take a stand and go a direction, sometimes even if it's wrong. It may be wrong, but I'd at least rather have a courageous leader. I, you know, in the military, I don't know if you'd like World War II. Um, I, I probably wouldn't have liked it if I was there. Um, but I like watching World War II stories um, for a couple of reasons. One is because you see the mighty hand of God working in the midst of our people. Saving a nation through calamity and rising up a people to be a superpower in the world. You see the hand of God all over World War II. Something else that I see in World War II, and that is the bold and courageous men who took and led others into combat. With plans and determination to, to stay the course and to win the victory. And if they were wrong and they, they suffered losses, they regrouped and they, and they re-strategized, but they didn't give up hope. They didn't, they didn't start doubting. They didn't start saying, well, what would you like to do? Well, maybe we ought to do this. They were determined to win. It was a victory that they had a course set. And they were going to make it. And even if they had to redirect their, their strategy, and if, even if they had to rethink their, 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 their techniques, their faith was anchored in the certainty 
that they were going to be victorious. Names like Patton and MacArthur rise up from that generation. And we hear these names bandied about today as heroes. Why? They didn't try to become heroes. But they had a determined faith that they weren't going to lose. And they did. You see, real leadership looks to the future, not just with pie in the sky optimism, but with a certainty that the direction that they're going is right. Even if they have to make course corrections on the way, they know it's right. Now, we have a couple of leaders that believe that they're right, that know that they're right, and they're, they're, they're diametrically opposed. Jesus knows he's right. The devil knows he's right. Actually, he knows he's wrong, but he's pretending that he knows he's right. Who are you going to listen to? The devil says to Adam and Eve, go ahead and take the fruit. God's been lying to you all along. God says, I told you before, do not eat of the fruit of the tree or you'll die. You'll not surely die. Well, let's go ahead and give this a try then. It sounds better for us. Okay, now we're going back to the tickling ears again. Jesus says, follow me, and I will make your way to eternal glory in the kingdom of heaven that is waiting for those who believe. And then he gets crucified. Wow. Really, that's where we're heading? Hmm. Real leadership stays the course and has faith that what God said is true and right. And we're not going to sway and violate what God says. Even if our plans and procedures need to be adjusted along the way. It says here, I love this, consider Abraham. If you want to consider a leader, a faith that a leader had, Abraham. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. So those, this is verse 9 now, so those who have faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. If we have faith, it's because others had faith before us who gave us the faith that we have now, who's passed it down from faith to faith according to the Word of God. It's a faith worth imitating. A faith in Jesus Christ. A faith in God and His Word. An absolute certainty that what God said is true. And like the Bible says, like God be true in every man a liar, that I am going to place my faith in the man who places his faith in God. And in God's work. I'm looking for a leader who has a determined faith, a courageous faith, that is not going to shift and change according to the blowing winds. Whichever way the wind blows, that's the way they're going to tack. It's now becoming more popular to believe this, so this is what I'm going to believe now too. The consensus is that this is okay, so I'm going to agree that that's okay too. That's not a leader. Now we're getting back to manipulation. But we've got one more thing to see, and I know our time has pretty much run out, but I want you to stick with me just a little bit longer. We've got one more thing to see, that if we're going to define leadership, it is a message worth hearing, it is a life worth considering, it is a faith worth imitating, and a, an example worth exalting. There's only one example worth exalting. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. There's a constancy in leadership and Jesus Christ was the constant and consummate leader. There is one leader who always speaks the truth, who always lives in perfect consistency with the truth and who pursues God's purpose with unwavering faith. Jesus Christ the Lord. There is no other leader in this world who is like Jesus. Even the Father says this, And a cloud appeared and enveloped them, and a voice came from heaven, came from the cloud, saying, This is my Son, whom I love. What does it say? Come on, what does it say? One more time. 
Listen to him. That's the words. Listen to him. Don't ignore his words. Don't parse them out as some kind of religious speech. Don't take his words with a grain of salt. God help the man who takes Jesus with a grain of salt. There was another person in the Old Testament who became a grain of salt. Actually a pillar of salt, lots of grains. Do not think that Jesus and his words are worth your debate. They are not for debate. They are for obeying. They are not for your opinions. They are not there for you to have some spiritual conversation. They are for you to put into life practice. If you want a leader, if you want a real leader, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You'll never find a leader like Jesus. We're going to go through presidents, and I don't know if I have 50 years left in me. I don't know. But in, in, in the next 40 years, even maybe, we're going to maybe see 10 more presidents or five more. I don't know how that's going to go. Our country has seen 40, what, four presidents now? They come and go. We've had senators and congressmen. We've had votes and opinions. We've had... All of the pundits making all of their grandiose claims. Jesus Christ is the same. I, it doesn't really matter to me in this sense. Who becomes the next president? In this sense it doesn't matter to me because Jesus Christ is my leader. He is my captain. He is my king. He is my brother. My elder brother who I will serve wholeheartedly until he returns, or until I go to meet him. I will stand for the truth. I will proclaim it from the mountaintops if I'm allowed, or I will whisper in the dark if that's what it takes. But Jesus Christ is my leader. Anyone else has to come after him. And if he doesn't come after Jesus, and he doesn't follow Jesus, he's not going to lead my life. We're going to have presidents come and go, folks. We have one king. And I want my next president to be willing to follow him. If we're going to define leadership, it's going to have to be defined God's ways. And if you're facing the conundrum of who to vote for in the polls, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for. But I'm going to tell you this. You had better cast your ballot for the one who rises to the level that God has established for leadership. Otherwise, you are asking the devil to take charge. Let's stand in prayer.